Hi, this is Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab. Um, I'm going to do the moderation and housekeeping and introductions, and then turn it over to Richard. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from Dana Farber, where I've got my IV ready and my uh, whatever you know, the little signature thing, uh, mm -hmm. wristband. Um, so, uh, as usual, our two disclaimers are that this is information only. Uh, this is not medical advice. You should use the information you hear in this session to get information to take to your medical team. And secondly, uh, this will be made public. Uh, so everything you say can and will be used against you. Uh, that's, that's my Miranda rights um, uh, reference. And uh, if you don't want to be uh, made public, turn off your camera, put a pseudonym and don't say anything. Um, today we're going to be talking about, oh, and I, I should put a, a plug in, uh, Cancer Patient Lab is a patient-led uh, volunteer community, and we would uh, re request a donation if you are so inclined. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, a services guide. Uh, this is something that I've been working on for a couple of years, gathering um, uh, service providers that patients can take patients and caregivers can take advantage of to inform them about various aspects of their care, everything from mental health to financial issues to um, how do you keep uh, communication with friends and family. Uh, but it starts with diagnostics and then it also goes into treatment matching. Uh, and so Richard has been uh, going to lead us in a discussion about uh, ideas we have for building this out this services guide and focusing on diagnostics in particular. Richard. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so I come from the computer business, at least in an earlier life. And uh, what I remember about the computer business is it was marked by, well, it was marked by this thing called user groups. And user groups have a venerable tradition. I did a quick Google search just to sort of check on it. And, you know, I think in some ways an early user group was the British Royal Society, a bunch of amateur people who wanted to be scientists who banded together to start talking about science as amateurs. And it developed into the world's most prestigious, uh, one of the world's most prestigious scientific uh, institutions. Uh, in the computer business, there was in 1975, the Homebrew Computer Club. That's sort of where Apple Computer started. Maybe some of you remember that. Uh, 1977, the Boston Computer Society started. I, it was started by a 13-year-old kid. It had thousands or tens of thousands of members. Um, and what these groups were characterized by is basically dedicated amateurs dealing with uh, a need to understand probably extremely complex information to self-educate themselves uh, to understand it with a pressing need to do it and a desire to sort of develop the tools and the camaraderie and the work together to try to figure out how to do that. So, you know, what was it, Brad? I sent you a note. It's in my presentation about when uh, the Cancer Patient Lab started, but what was it, a 2022, I think? I think that's what you said. Um, officially, and you know, the cancer patient lab, I think is in a way, a, a similar kind of effort. It's, it's a user group of people who are trying to sort of get together, collaborate and figure out how collectively to improve everybody's understanding of, you know, what they deal with as patients. And in, in thinking about sort of these user groups, um, there are lots and lots of issues particularly in the cancer cancer arena. So you're dealing with the need to make sense of a tremendous amount of information under a really, I think, you know, I've, I've been a patient, but um, not, you know, and I have family members who've been patients. I would not say I had a, a particularly difficult um, diagnosis, at least so far. Um, you know, I've had family members with more difficult diagnoses. I understand how extraordinarily difficult it can be in the face of uncertainty and time pressure uh, to make sense of really complicated information, which in a way is only quasi information because it's not extremely well curated. It's not definitive. It's kind of real time. So 
When you have all of that information coming at you, how do you make sense of it? How do you understand it? How do you interpret it, especially in the face of tremendous stress, time pressures, and uh, need to understand it quickly? Well, in the computer business, what I remember in the 1980s was the evolution of a quasi-consumer magazine, or really hundreds of magazines. Um, one of them, maybe some of you remember it, was PC Magazine. In the 70s, I guess it started with Byte Magazine, but in the 80s, uh, PC Magazine, and, and literally hundreds of others. I was a little bit in the magazine business at that time, and I remember it was an extraordinarily robust fertilization of all of these magazines, which started going out and providing people with extremely technical information, but in a kind of consumer way. What was the best router? What's the best ADSL technology? How do you find a switch? I mean, this is not the kind of stuff that an average person would want, but yet it had the kind of graphics and reviews as if it was a consumer review guide to cars. And looking at that kind of history and thinking about it, I came to the conclusion that for something like cancer diagnostics, it's a similar field and it perhaps could benefit from some kind of similar guide. And so the purpose of today's discussion is to, you know, start trying to figure out with everybody's help, because this is by no means something that I am equipped to do by myself or even fully figure out by myself. But I think with the people in this room and others, we can perhaps start to make some progress on a number of questions, including whether we want to actually do it or how we would do it or what it would look like. So talking about that guide is going to be in a couple of minutes uh, where we're, where we're going to sort of start this effort. I, I should say that in some ways, what's going on in the cancer, uh, personal cancer diagnostics area right now reminds me a little bit of the computer business. And maybe those of you who are students of industrial organization, any, many other businesses, there are an enormous number of cancer diagnostics that are just blooming constantly. And I can tell you that in five or 10 years, there are going to be far fewer of them. But right now, there are lots of them. And you know, trying to curate and make sense of them is is what we're going to do. Um, Brad has developed and shared with me a, a fantastic guide to cancer services. It's very robust and um, really an impressive effort. And this conversation today will by no means replace that guide, but hopefully will supplement and deepen it in a certain area. But I think that maybe the first thing we should do is hear from Brad to talk about the guide that perhaps many of you, you are familiar with, but maybe not all of you. Great. So <clears throat> this has been kind of a working document um, that we have had. Uh, I, I Every time I hear about a new service provider, I uh, add to the list. And there are 40 services. Um, there's a preamble up at the front which says, uh, you know, use this at your own risk. Um, but uh, it's broken into, like I said, 40 services. So test integration, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing. These are the di this is the diagnostic section: liquid biopsies, proteomics, functional testing, spatial analysis, animal testing, microbiome testing, metabolomics, pharmacogenomics, scan interpretation, radiology services, and immune system profiling. So these are 14, and then it goes on to others, treatment options and matching services. And as I said before, um, mental health, exercise. Uh, and I add to this every day, like yesterday I spoke to us, this company, Sonala Sense, which has a sound therapy where they inject a drug to get by ultrasound. So this is constantly evolving and changing every day, practically, as I learn about new companies. Um, so I'm happy to share this with anyone, but this sets up the context. And this is, uh, what do they say about biting off an elephant? <laughs> if we took this whole thing on and tried to make it all great, it would be a lot. It's already just in the diagnostic space here. As you can see, there are 14 different services. And we have uh, a process 
it may not be visible to everyone, but at the Cancer Patient Lab, we ask many of these companies to pitch us to basically tell us about their service and then patients raise their hand and say, let me get that service. Um, Brian just had a session last week with Boston Gene. Michael Hensley is on today. We like Boston Gene. They're one of our more favored service providers. I'm going to get a test from Natera um, for uh, my immune system analysis. Um, so uh, we, for in each of these areas, we've both identified all the service providers that we know about, as well as um, starting to identify ones that we like, let's say more than others, or where there where there's experience among the patients in our community. So that's that's basically the the backdrop to this. And as I said, I'm happy to share it uh, uh, with anyone who is interested. It's a working document, and um, you, you can see pretty much what it entails. So. Maybe a week or so ago, I sent Brad a, a few pages of questions. I mean, it, it came to that, but you can you can look at this and just look at all the different categories and see that there are an enormous number of questions that you can raise. And, you know, one idea of what we could do today, but we're not going to, is just start going through a list of really specific questions about what we're going to ask. And, you know... Well, do you work with mice? Are they immunocompromised mice? Are they white mice? How long? I mean, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, we'll need to get to those kinds of questions if we move forward with this. But I thought that perhaps the best way to start was with a working session where we um, start a little bit higher level than that. And, you know, maybe just the first set of questions. Well, I mean, maybe the very first question, you know, it seems clear to me, but you know, this is a an esteemed group with a, a lot of stake in this. Is something like this useful? I mean, is I there anyone one, who I thinks? Saw, I saw I saw one thumbs up from uh, uh, from from Chris. There we go. I saw a couple of head nods. I, I'm yeah. assuming that's good. If if someone thinks it's not useful, send a you know send a Raz or a an Elon Musk, uh, you know, icon or something. <laughs> Alan, Alan is uh, used. The, we like the raise hand feature here. So um, if uh, if you want to comment, you can use the raise hand feature. Alan, what would what would your comment? Um, my first is really quick. I'm going to graze on it. I think it's important. Um, it's uh, you know, I I I didn't I didn't catch the 1970 evolution of ground uh, swell uh com computer hacking started starting started by a 13 year old in the boston area but never mind i was there at the time um that's another thing um as far as um thinking about time i think it's important to uh, as a super arching concept try to divide this stuff and actually it's it's more um pertinent to treatment something that is established then div divide the established stuff into hey this has been established for 30 years this has been established for five years this has been established for one year that's really important because if somebody says it's established it's well is there 30 years and we know all the side effects over 30 years and the and people have experience in giving that treatment and oh is this only landed in the last year in which p case Clinicians themselves don't have much experience of it. For example, the diagnostic PSMA PET CT, it was FDA approved in 2021. Ask yourself, how much experience do all of the clinicians have with it? I can give you the answer, except for the researchers that developed it, their only experience is about two years worth. Okay, so that's the established time. Then you can move forward, and I don't even have words for it. Maybe you guys can uh, develop words for it, but one is maybe like, um, emerging. I don't know what the word for intermediate is, and I don't know what the word for future is. But for example, Brad once lamented, hey, the, all this molecular stuff, this molecular stuff looks like it's going to be the breakthrough with combinatory uh, approaches. Well, his thought was, geez, this is going to be 20 years or 30 years away. Then we heard a talk by Michael Castro, who had some sort of AI approach to um, what is a comp, you know, what we all know, it, the human being biologic system 
is these innumerable cascades of proteins uh, that are being enumerated right now that all of them will make your head spin. Um, so Brad thought, hey, this is going to be some future thing in 20 to 30 years. Then he heard Castro talk and he thought, hey, maybe this is going to be in 10 years. So I, I guess one framework for looking at all this stuff, including diagnostics, is what time thing do you put on top of it? Now, this speaks to, for example, um, minimal residual disease, which we uh, were in a mini discussion about. And it turns out, for example, you have all these companies listed. Well, you have Natera buried in a sea of other people that do MRD. Well, let me tell you about Natera. Natera is actually in, in the NCCN guidelines as suggested uh, diagnostic for the specific category of stage two and stage three colorectal cancers. And people on the ground, even in backwater where I am, are actually using Natera in a sense, in a commercial basis. So for example, the framework for all these tests, maybe the first category is research only versus this is already commercialized. And I am not a I'm not a business person or a legal person to know how you go from putting the research title on to how you put the commercialization title on. For example, uh, concerning the Terra, I thought, oh, these guys are the front runners. They're in, in, in NCCN guidelines. But it turns out um, Tempest literally just sent uh, in my inbox on June uh, 3rd that they are commercial now with their minimal residual disease test. Um, so this is also a moving target. Oh, geez, I need to change this research only category to it's now commercialized. And I don't know how to divide all those categories up, but certainly making it into the NCCN guidelines would I think uh, warrant the term established. I'm sorry for talking so much. That's one of my problems. I'm gonna stop now for people to comment. Alan, it's one of your problems and one of your virtues. So, um, uh, you know, I think that that's really helpful. And and uh, maybe Brad, I don't know if you or Brian has an email list of the people who are on this call today, um, but I would be happy to send, uh, assuming that computer resurrects, which I believe it will, um, I'd be happy to send a uh, 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 the presentation to people because it has some of that in it, but I, I mean, I think you've put a, a lot of edge to it. I, I want to stay at a little bit of a high level. Maybe I'm being unduly deliberate. And if people want to burrow right into sort of details at that level or even beyond, uh, do you need to go out? Brad, Brad is, uh, I think Brad is getting a shot. Um, if we, uh, you know, if we want to, burrow in that's great if we want to uh, stay at this high level for a few minutes i think it might be helpful to do that um but some of the higher level questions i would want to explore are one of them is who is the guide for i mean it seems like an obvious question it's for patients and families i assume but is it something that clinicians might find useful? Is it something that an insurance company trying to figure out uh, if something should be reimbursed would find helpful? Um, you know, NCCN guidelines often determine a good chunk of, of cancer patient reimbursement, as I understand it. If it's in the guidelines, it can be reimbursed, even though it's uh, not necessarily, it, it's sort of a shortcut for reimbursement in cancer, I think, because of some of the Medicare policies. Is it obvious who this guide is for, or do we want to think about that a little bit more broadly? If it's obvious, you know, just say that, but I think that might be a question. Uh, Jane, Jane, Jane. You, yeah. you know, I, I think yeah, I've been in this space for, um, for a relatively short time compared to you all. Um, you know, but one thing I have seen, especially coming from the rare cancer space, which is which is where I'm living, is I do think that this is helpful for patients and physicians equally. You know, there are a lot of patients who are going to oncologists, going to going to the um to um to the physicians saying, hey, what about this? Have you heard about this? And in some of these cases, some of the oncologists are actually saying, I haven't heard about this. Um, tell me more so the patients are actually and and i know you've all been here and experienced this are actually the educators back to the oncologist so i do think this does have a value to the oncologist um 
one thing I can't speak to is is the is the mess that is the insurance and reimbursement world, but I think this really does have a very strong value to the patients and the oncologist equally. Well, that's just to uh, underline that... just to underline what Jane just said. I had a conversation last week with Moyes Jiwa, who's uh, uh, he's in a medical school in Australia, and he said two things: doctors have to realize that they are continuous learners that they're going to have to learn over their whole career because the world's changing every you know few months and secondly doctors can learn from patients because a patient i think the the logic is a patient comes to a fork in the road and has to make a decision and they survey what's out there and then they bring it to their doctor and their doctor might know what the answer was three months ago six months ago a year ago but that might be different than the answer today so patients are continuously surveying the, the treatment and testing possibilities and then bringing it to their doctors. So their doctors really should recognize that they're going to be learning from, from their patients. It reminds me, uh, Jane, that, that comment. Again, you know, you keep going back to the things you know. And one of the things I knew once upon a time was the computer business. And I kind of remember these, these MIS directors and companies frantic because all of a sudden these people were telling them how to what kind of computer software they wanted to install on these microcomputers that they were bringing into the office and subverting the the process so i could imagine that clinicians are you know they're they're they've got to be struggling with all of the different tests that are out there yeah so I, and I, you know and and, and and in in complete defense of the amazing healthcare providers that we do have i mean they just don't a lot of them don't have the time carved out to be able to stay on top of the research, um, you know, and I, as I focus on appendiceal cancer right now, it that's typically a surgical oncology approach, you know, and it really moves into into medical oncology because it does take a primary surgical approach. The surgical oncologists have even less bandwidth to be able to kind of immerse themselves into mm. into some of the more research modes as well. So, um, Chris, hi. Uh, you're on mute, I think. Uh, oh, okay. now let me let me talk. So first of all, uh, I'd like to to comment on that. And actually, um, it would be great if uh, perhaps Glenn also can can bring some oncologists on board to our meeting. I actually, I think that would be very valuable. I'm delighted that Alan is here as a, as a pathologist, and therefore can also provide uh, more the physician's perspective. Um, and um, I personally like, uh, Richard, the analogy of how it started back then in the computer world and now how things are evolving here. There is um, a little difference here I would like to point out. And the difference is that um, the d ultimate decision on, on what will be made is basically a decision of the physician. There, the healthcare system is fairly established. And if the patient says, I want A, B, and C, and the oncologist says, nope, I don't think so, because my guidelines say something different, um, then you can come up with all the, the, the material, that we, with all the data, with all the evidence, and they would just say, nope, I can't do that, uh, sorry. I would love to, but my NCCN guidelines won't allow me to do so. Um, and, um, and or this is experimental or this is preclinical and um, I, I, I don't, I, yeah, so, so there are, one needs to, one thing is how much bandwidth does an oncologist have to educate him or herself? That's one part, but the other part is actually, and, and there are oncologists, I'm sure that they're out there, that really have tried to stay on top of it and Dr. Castro is one of those examples um, who actually kind of pushes the guidelines and is constantly seeking of what's the best possible way to treat this patient. But for the majority of oncologists, especially those in the NCCN guideline centers, they are basically bound by the NCCN guideline rules. And so when, if they were going out of their way to go beyond that, it's actually not only a question of time, it's also a question of are they practicing outside of guidelines? Will it be covered by insurance? Will they actually open themselves up for attack from being not meeting standard of care? 
So there are there is more to that because in the healthcare system, the customer is not identical and identical with the decision maker. And just just as an example, and and therefore I think actually we it would be helpful to get an oncologist or several oncologists on board in our discussions that can actually also provide this guidance and perspective. And Alan, um, please let me know what, whether you would agree with, with this perspective. Oh, I see hands up, so I should stop. Yeah, yeah there's a there's a, a, a lot of comments, um, so that that's great. But I think that that's a really good point. And there are a number of considerations which as soon as uh, we hear from Robert, we'll, we'll get to, but they range from topics like you know, is this a reimbursed test? Is this a test which changes treatment? Is this a test which applies to certain types of cancers? I mean, these are all sorts of questions that we should explore whether we want to explore them. What is this guide going to look like is really the one of the formative questions that will at least begin to, I hope, get purchase on today. But Robert, you have the floor. Uh, and you're on mute. Everyone's very respectful. They put yeah, themselves um, on mute. I saw Brian has his hand up. Go, uh, go ahead, Bob. Does he? Go ahead, Bob. Oh, is that yeah. your hand? Oh, I'm it sorry, is my Brian. Hand. I, that's no, that's okay. I, I'd rather. It's hear right in the middle of the logo. I missed it. But, <laughs> it's, so, it's Brian, I, 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 Brian, you're like the you're you're one of the no, leaders. No, 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 no. You can no, no, cede no, no. the floor if you want. Yeah, yeah. But you'll I'll, go I'll, after. I'll, I'll like you'll Bob choose down. when to go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I, I think it depends on the oncologist. So, my oncologist. So I just started chemo with uh, cabazitaxel and carboplatin. I did functional testing with Dr. Apple's co company, Sage Medic. And what showed up as the most efficacious is the toxintrone, which is 25, 30 years ago, the standard of care. And my oncologist is, let's try the standard of care. If we don't get results. We have the drug in our pharmacy. I'm very willing to do it. I haven't used it since fellowship, but he's willing to go outside the box. He's also willing to go outside the box if we can get this under control to do double immune therapy, which is basically in phase two trials in England. Um, so, you know, he's going to, I'm at Box Chase Cancer Center, he's going to the powers that be to get the pre-approval to do this. So I, I think it's very individualized and maybe it also has to do with the institution. Some are- Well, well that suggests, I mean, today is of course not a discussion or at least not directly a discussion of the difficulty of getting something prescribed but i think it is that does raise the issue of you know you've raised that topic it sounds like maybe one of the issues that should be in a guide is a discussion of what is the way in which this thing would be prescribed by a clinician or what is the way in which this thing would be reimbursed by a clinician and i assume that a, a well organized um diagnostics testing company will have clinicians and methods of getting their product used by clinicians and ways of potentially getting it reimbursed. A product that's great that no one can prescribe or no one can pay for is not as good a product as one that someone can. So that sounds like a topic that should be included. Um, Jeff. Hello. Um... Uh, uh, there are two Jeffs. I, I, I meant Jeff Krolik and, and then uh, okay. Okay. Jeff Good Dwyer. Jeff first. Okay. Um, and then, and then Brian, you're on it whenever you want to be, but Glenn also has raised his hand or, or virtually raised his hand because the thing doesn't work. So let's get to him after, um, after the two Jeffs. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so my experience uh, prior to my uh, 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 cancer diagnosis uh, was in the behavioral health field. <clears throat> uh, I was uh, senior manager, and that included uh, administratively overseeing the uh, medical staff, including psychiatrists. And um, across the board, uh, the psychiatrists, the medical staff, in particular, the MDs were 
the slowest to respond to any innovation, the electronic health records. Uh, we had people dictating for years and years after electronic health records. So <clears throat> my point is <clears throat> the adoption of something new, and this is uh, 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 what I've heard uh, uh, people talking about, is very, very slow. And again, my experience is a standard of care limits uh, you know, the range that uh, uh, an oncologist can practice within, uh, although I have had the experience of um, uh, a radiation oncologist being very clear, here's the standard of care. What you and your medical oncologist are asking is outside of that. I'm willing to do it. We're covered with the release. Um, but I just want to make, you said it like five times, this is outside the standard of care. So I think there's a great variability um, in that. And my medical oncologist, uh, who has uh, more flexibility, uh, for better or worse, uh, is a private pay. And uh, she says she does that because otherwise she feels she's working for the insurance company. Uh, in all decision matters. So this lets me and uh, the oncologist step outside of that and she can reach out to other experts. Uh, she's very responsive um, uh, if there's something I would like to do, but it's so individual uh, in terms of, you know, each of our experience with uh, our medical oncologists that, Boy, I, I, I guess I, my perspective is uh, it would have some limited appeal to some oncologists who have the latitude uh, and wherewithal, uh, and they're not so concerned about the liability to explore uh, some of those other uh, avenues. So I think this is more of a patient uh, for patient use, uh, for those of us that want to advocate, uh, and we're clearly uh, pretty uh, creative and clever in getting our needs met in that way. So you're sort of seeing this guide as a a patient pull, a, a patient push, rather than a, or I don't know the, I don't know my prepositions, but you're you're seeing this as led by patients. The guide is for patients. Um, it's not necessarily of strong utility to the practitioner, except in, in, in so general, far as the that patient would be, says. Yeah, that would be my limited uh, okay. uh, perspective, and based on how well we can uh, advocate and marshal our resources, um, we may be able to uh, interest an oncologist in moving in a particular uh, direction. And and Chris uh, sees that as well as sort of a patient guide. I I, I kind of had my own thought that uh, if it was well done, it might be the sort of thing that a clinician would say, well, you know, I've never heard of that test, but let me look. And I don't know, someday maybe if it's not too much to hope, we could actually have, I don't know, we'd have to be careful about that ratings or reviews or something in a scientifically defendable way that might appeal to clinicians. But that's obviously a topic um, for serious discussion as we move forward. Um, well, another Jeff feature that I hear in, behind this is the patient would need to be armed with the evidence to bring to their doctor. And this guy could have that. I mean, among that. other things, uh, you know, I kind of, um, I, I sort of love evidence. Um, so uh, 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 Jeff, number two, though, I think you've been patiently waiting in this queue. I don't know. I'm just I was thinking about what what your your intended use is for this guide, Brad. And so I just what I did was I rolled back in my thought pattern what I did five years ago when uh, for most patients, uh, it will be interesting to see what the guys think about this. But most patients, and I'm talking about myself, when you are diagnosed with any cancer, but for my case, it was prostate cancer. You have not focused on this at all, but you know it's, you know, anecdotally from friends and family that it's bad. 
So now you have to learn about it. And so how do you learn about it? Um, it would be, as a patient, it would be incredibly helpful to know that there's layers that when you come to the fork in the, fork in the road that Brad describes, you don't go down that particular fork because you're gonna run up against something that you will later learn is a dead end. For instance, what Jeff just talked about, he said his uh, medical oncologist um, is very rigid conservative and won't work outside, or no, his, his radiation oncologist won't work outside standard of care. Well, when you just start your journey, with cancer, you don't, you've never heard about it. You don't understand what the standard of care is and you don't understand, as was pointed out, that the decision is not yours. You're of the, you're of the, um, the fallacy that you can make a decision when you read about something in uh, some article, oh, I can, I can get that, except you probably cannot because one of the gentlemen we had present here was eye-opening to me and it was a gentleman from and and uh, brad will recall it he's a doctor from dana farber and his program was very interesting but it, as he later pointed out he said all these things are wonderful but because they haven't gotten their progress through the Random clinical trial. Well, what the hell is that when you've just, what's a random clinical trial? Um, his point was, I, I can't take that to clinic. In fact, anything I've talked about today, I can't take to clinic because it's not been vetted by my colleagues in the professional community, vetted by the um, insurance companies, vetted by my hospital. So you realize that He's a wonderful guy to talk to at a cocktail party because he's, um, or something, but he's not gonna help you in the treatment you have to select next week. Is it surgery, is it radiation, is it, it whatever you, for your particular cancer. So if it's a guide for patients, from patients, it would be really helpful as Alan talks about, is this an emerging thing or has it been around for like, um, Bob just talked about is this a is this a um, a cancer ADT drug that has been around for twenty years and I'll have no problem getting except that the medical oncologists no longer use it and it, because at the last um, professional standards group it was taken off the stand it was it remains on the standard of care list. But it's not what they've all um, agreed they're going to do next year. Um, they're, they're going to use the third generation or the fourth generation. So as a cancer guide, if this is going to be useful, you've got to try to be continually updating it for what happened last year that is now approved by the for paying because that's what it comes down to real fast is are they is the facility where you're going to get your care will they get reimbursed from the insurance company because if they're not going to be you're not going to get that special thing you just read about in science today it's not going to happen well you, you know it's a really interesting topic that we're obviously converging on a little bit i mean to to pay respect to clinicians, which I know everybody has tremendous respect for, you know, their job, I try, I always try to think about what the perspective of other people are. You know, I try to do that in politics to my wife's consternation. I say, well, this, this group thinks this way. And, you know, they, they come to it from this legitimate purpose sometimes. And, you know, clinicians, I, I think they view their role as like they're, they're guarding against the, the white walkers, you know, coming in and their job is to keep things descending from descending into chaos. And so, you know, that's a very tough line for them to navigate. But, you know, the point of something being reimbursed or not being reimbursed, I mean, there are patients who, I mean, you know, Dr. No can afford to pay for anything. 
Um, he's got that island. He's got that sort of redoubt underneath the island. He can afford to do that. So maybe saying that there's yeah, no reimbursement. Rare. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but <laughs> but you know, there 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 might. It sounds like it would be important for this guide to have the meta purpose of helping patients thread the needle of how to get this thing put into the patient if it's appropriate to get it into the patient. I saw Alan's really interesting comment about sort of a, you know, a, maybe a level of evidence thermometer or something or scale or whatever. I think that's a, a really nifty idea. Um, we have um, Brian, you're the gatekeeper for you and Glenn. So, you know, it's one of you and then the other. I think okay, for cool. the next so two I'm gonna, I'm gonna give um I'm gonna give um uh Glenn the, the floor. Um first of all, uh thank you, Brad, for growing this amazing resource that you've been working on over the last couple of years. And uh I've been able to contribute a little bit here and there, but I just think it's a a, a wonderful uh foundation. Um, that can certainly be that that would serve you know like multiple utility over over time. I think what we're discussing there's a lot of interconnected pieces here um, in terms of prescribing off label and combinations, et cetera. Right now, I think it's about forty percent of the FDA approved anti-cancer drugs. 40% are currently prescribed off-label. It's a matter of finding out uh, who some of these prescribers are within community and even academic settings. Um, you know, I've been uh, consulting to uh, Cancer Commons and helping them with some business development and a couple key projects. And I can speak to two of them quickly one is an N of one physicians network, which we started collecting uh, names. We have a few dozens that have been contributed from various folks. Uh, Jeff Krolik would love to, to learn who your uh, concierge medical oncologist is. This list so far comprises both academics and uh, community uh, oncologists. It'll be expanded to include uh, some surgical uh, some surgical oncologists, some uh, some radiation oncologists, pathologists, uh, even some interventional radiologists that are doing some really innovative work. And it will be free for those very well vetted uh, practitioners that go through an application process that will live on the back end of of Cancer Commons, which should go uh, live, but in a very kind of private way in the next several weeks. Um, and there's different criteria uh, through which various types of, uh, you know, oncologists will prescribe in this way. When you look at uh, neuroonks as an example that are dealing with, with GBM and some really difficult pediatric malignancies, you know, they're, they're more open to others uh, because the standard of care, like with GBM, starts with the trial at this point. And so it, it varies under what condition, you know, so not everyone is going to necessarily work with patients this way in a, in a pan cancer kind of way at a, at a community level. So we're actively uh, putting together this list and the usage guidelines uh, to, to kind of develop this in a meaningful way that uh, various testing companies can utilize responsibly uh, and where uh, patients at some level will be able to have access of, of you know, a few matches based on their particular situation and desired geography, you know, to work with a provider, et cetera. So that's the N of one physicians network. Um, in terms of service providers, uh, also working on a, uh, a database that will live on the back end of Cancer Commons. It's essentially a, a precision slash personalized oncology service uh, providers uh, database uh, where 
various companies uh, such as Sage Medic will uh, upload their the information into forms, uh, all validation information will be uh, will be collected uh, and will be updated regularly. It will go through a vetting process through the Cancer Commons scientific team. Uh, there will be folks on, you know, uh, folks such as Chris, hopefully, that will be on an advisory board that will provide input to the processes and the questions that are asked and you know, how we go about collecting some of this key uh, information. Uh, from there, we'll be working with a partner to uh, develop uh, diagnostic workups, diagnostic workups for specific kind of buckets of disease, at least at the beginning. We'll be starting with GBM because that's where, uh, you know, the scientific team at Cancer Commons has a lot of experience in that area. Uh, you know, specifically, you know, Adrian Nugent and the connections with uh, Al Misella uh, and Vanessa Hugo and others. Um, and we'll be working with a, a major diagnostic lab uh, who will help figure out that diagnostic workup that will then inform the navigation patient workflow that will put together not just their own proprietary uh, tests, but will include third party testing. So essentially covering, you know, all the molecular uh, DNA, RNA testing, uh, functional assays, uh, multiomics, et cetera, other types of testing. Uh, and they will be. Well, what, so, what do you mean cover? What do you mean cover, Glenn? So the amount of testing is, you know, is really vast and it goes beyond just the molecular, you know, testing that's typically done. Hopefully, you know, more should be done. Uh, but that's kind of the go to where you have, you know, uh, targetable uh, mutations and biomarkers uh, through that molecular kind of process of testing that's done through, you know, next gen sequencing and whole exome sequencing, et cetera. And then you have all the functional types of testing, organoids and tissue based and, you know, that sort of thing. So it's sort of a compendium, I think. It's sort a whole a wide, vast range uh, within the database that will speak to, you know, are, is this commercially available? Under what situations is there CPT codes? Are payers covering it? Uh, Got it. You know, is it cash pay? Does the company have a patient, uh, you know, provide uh, you know, patient uh, support, you know, like Boston Gene is an example, is really phenomenal in, you know, uh, supporting folks that can't afford these tests because maybe they're not viewed as clinically indicated and therefore covered by CMS or through commercial payers, just as an example. And so the same partner uh, will also be charged with the critical unmet need of interpreting across all multiple data sets to better inform uh, treatment recommendations. So wow. we're looking very at, ambitious. Yeah, so it is very ambitious, ambitious. Uh, and we're, we're making, right now we've got some momentum. We're making progress on all fronts, even on drug acquisition and hopefully beyond just compassionate use and, and um, you know, uh, um, the other program I'm spacing on, uh, compassionate use and what's the other one? Humanitarian exemption for devices. Uh, I mean. Yeah, there's the uh, other program, not right to try, compassionate use and- it, it's, uh, a, it's, yeah, it's basically compassionate use anyway, but it's, uh, yeah. it's just a different name for it. Yep. Right. So it, yeah, so it's, these are, but these all connect. And so the idea to have a list of vetted, you know, science, science by scientists, a, group, uh, a list of services that are vetted through a nonprofit to have that imprimatur to be, you know, a, a preferred provider, the idea of connecting it to commerce where there's actually a marketplace uh, where folks will be able to purchase very easily, but with guidance different services, whether it's through 
uh, you know, CMS or commercial providers or direct pay, or in, in many cases could be a quid pro quo for tissue uh, for that. No, no, I think that that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, that's what we want to do. And that's what this discussion is teeing up. So thank you very much for, for talking about that. That's, sure. that's, uh, that's a great project. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, stop there. Yeah. Uh, Brian. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'll on. try to be um, quick. Um, so first off, um, thanks so much for making this um, a topic of discussion. This is a really good one. I love it in terms of how it shapes what we do today, but also how we think about it in the future. So there's um, three points that I wanted to bring up. One is um, sort of like, why do we need this? And I think that there is a today version, and I think that there is sort of a, maybe a, a more lofty um, reason to have it in the future. For today, we want to use this um, at this you know the, use this best services guide to make better data driven treatments, which will ultimately extend our lives as patients and improve our quality of life. And I think that we already, you know, have many examples of how uh, cancer patient lab patients have taken advantage of these service providers, whether it's Boston Gene or it's Sengen or it's Sage Medic uh, or M-Probe for proteomics. Um, and I think in many of these cases, these patients are bringing these service uh, these services to their medical oncologist to um, to to make better data driven uh, decisions. I know certainly that's the case for me, uh, and I you know I think that, that Bob just talked about how he used um, Sage to bring data to his oncologist. Um, they decided to go maybe in a little bit different um, uh, direction, um, but they still have uh, the treatment option that Bob mentioned um, in their back pocket. So you know the why why we're doing this is critical. It's really and this is our true north, right? This is to make better data-driven treatment decisions. There was a really interesting part in this discussion as we talked about the constituents. Um, and so if we think about, you know, a second reason for the why, the future, um, perhaps we could create the services guide such that it becomes the gold standard. At one juncture in my career, I, I always considered the gold standard to be like, sort of like the Lloyds of London of banking, right? We just had this, you know, um, incredible reputation. Um, and if we could do that, create the services guide such that it is the gold standard, it's not just the gold standard for patients, but also for clinicians, insurance, insurance companies, pharma, other life sciences companies, then what you do is you actually can bring these constituents together such that they're mm. having a conversation around the value of these service providers. And, um, and then I think that there's like another layer we've talked about um, the various levels of maturity, what I, what I would almost describe as sort of maturity of each of these different service providers. Some of them are research use only, some of them are you know, already in, in practice. We could kind of like filter in that layer in terms of how we think about those service providers. And that would be part of um, the qualifications that we would use, the peer review also came into that as well. Um, but that's how I kind of see this is from a why perspective, extend patient lives, make data better data driven um, decisions. And then also just um, a another tool um, for us to bring all of these constituents together because today they often don't um, they often don't they're not on the same page. And so we need to do that. Yeah. The third point I wanted to make um, is that I would, I would really love to have like Eric Topol <laughs> weigh in on this. Um, one of the very first books that I read uh, when I started my journey is The Patient Will See You Now. And, you know, he made a lot of parallel um, parallels to, uh, you know, computer industry um, and just access to information. Um, but um, Richard, I, I think how you started this conversation around the notion of user groups is really, really important. And I'd love to get his perspective on how a user group like Cancer Patient Lab um, can help to bring this together. 
you know, how do we get that critical mass? How do we get that scale such that we, we, um, we can really affect change such that his vision of how the patient will see you now actually becomes um, a reality. Um, and, and, and I'll just, I'll make one fourth point, which is um, uh, Dr. Apple, um, I know that you said that the, that the doctor is the decision maker. And I think that that's generally true. Um, however, um, we also have to remem remember that patients can always get second opinions and so um, it's not just a single doctor, but it's multiple doctors. And so if you think about it from that perspective, who really is the decision maker? Is it a doctor or is it the patient choosing across different doctors? Of course, each of those different doctors have various guidelines. They have guardrails, NCCN guidelines, et cetera. Um, but we all know that you will get different care uh, based upon who your doctor is and where you are in your journey. And there's a whole lot of different you know, layers of complexity. But I think to say that it's just the doctor that's making this, the decision, um, I think that there's some gray area and room for debate about that. And that's well, all I can Brian, that, that is a, a fabulous set of, of observations from someone who's thought deeply about this. And um, Brad warned me I, I never believe these warnings. I remember when I used to <laughs> teach, I'd come in with a huge slide deck and a good friend of mine who taught with me would say, you know, you got four hours of presentation here. I said, well, what if we don't have enough to cover and we got to make sure we cover it all? Brad said, we're going to run out of time. And God darn it, Brad was right. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I sort of want to throw a lightning round of some things that we might want to think about at people. I don't think we even have time to react to them, but there are some issues that I think are worth at least putting in the hopper. And I'm happy again, if I get the emails to send um, to send the deck, which starts the conversation, but believe me, there are a lot more questions that I've written down and certainly that would follow from this, but you know, some things that we want to think about. What degree of proof is this? Is this standard of care or not standard of care? I mean, these, uh, you know, other people have made these observations too. Are there trials? Um, uh, is this FDA approved? Where does it stand in the FDA cycle? Uh, are there many clinicians who are using it, whether or not it's, you know, approved? Is it an LDT, stuff like that? How do you think about that? What kind of cancer is this for? What stage of cancer is this for? What change in treatment does it do? Does it have a stage in, in treatment? Um, there are a lot of questions. Uh, one set of questions we haven't talked about at all are the legal questions. Another set of questions we haven't talked at all about are how we actually would do this. What should this thing look like? I mean, are we going to have a 50 page review of every company? Are we going to ask the companies to fill out questionnaires that we provide them? Maybe that's a starting point. And then we collate that information and then put the questionnaires together with interviews. There's an awful lot more to say. This is really the very beginning, I think, of this effort. And I am I can go a few extra minutes because I know there are some people who have, have some comments. But I don't know, Brad, maybe the maybe what we should do is have another meeting or a working group or something. And, and I could certainly send out the slide deck and I could also append to the slide deck dozens of semi-organized questions. Um, but, you know, all the different categories that we want to talk about are, you know, all of these are different categories in different areas for different purposes. And, you know, I think there's an, uh, there's a, this is a huge area to cover. And that became very clear to me when I, started to try to put some sense into it. So um, I think it would be very useful for us to have a working group or whatever you call it, a committee or a review board, you know, you call it what you want, but to have more, more minds focusing as we both ask these questions and get responses. So maybe we should make that a, a request that we can put out. We can manage this through email. Like you said, again, I, I do have email addresses for everyone here, which I can you know, send it out to, as well as we have our discussion forum, which I would encourage us to use um, as a place where we can sort of be public as we have discussion. But I'll tell you the idea that, um, you know, Brian's idea that this could be a standard. I mean, from observation, I have seen that sometimes the early entrants into a field do kind of define the parameters and the rules of play. 
And if this is a good guide, it could probably be very influential and that would be very useful for everybody. This, this if, if I can just uh, put a plug in here for our, our logo for just a second and explain, explain uh, our logo. If, if you guys can actually see this, um, I'm gonna, what we're talking about today is really embodied in our logo, which is that in the center, you have sort of this double helix, right? Um, the double helix, either side of the helix, there is the doctor that's represented. It's very hard to see, but down at the bottom, there's like a little stethoscope. And at the top is uh, this little head here, which is the patient. And so that's the, the commingling of the patient and the doctor, of course, grounded by science, which is what the whole double helix is all about. And that is surrounded by the community, which are the um, each of the four, um, uh, you know, colors and, and sort of like people that are, are represented around this. If I think about our logo, I think about this discussion. This discussion is all about our logo and our logo is all about our, this discussion, which is how do we take all of this science? How do we bring the community together? Not just this community, but all of the constituents that we talked about, insurance companies that aren't represented here, et cetera. How do you bring them together in this services guide? Um, and, you know, could be that. I mean, it's a grand vision and it's a lot of work. And we have to think about how we get the energy and the right people in the room to actually make it happen. But um, I don't see anything that's really more compelling in medicine right now than to actually pursue something like this. This is really, really important. And um, I think we're on to something. Brad's done an absolutely amazing job putting the services guide together. Um, and I know it's going to evolve, but it's going to take, you know, a, a lot of work and a lot of different people to get involved to make it work. So anyway, I'm totally in favor of a, of a working group um, and uh, excited about it. Uh, there are a couple of comments and you know, I, I think I, have a few. I think Richard, what I'll do is I'll stop the recording here. Yeah. And then we can those who want to stay around can chat informally. That sounds good.